Well, good afternoon. This is Alan Gassman, and I am with my friend and colleague, Lester Perling. And we are here to tell you about the health law update, especially for Florida, but also relating to CMS. And you may have heard of the ACA. Before we get started, I just want to mention I've got Lester's amazing biogra biography here. You should read it tonight if you have trouble sleeping. Mine you can use for scratch paper. Please, if you're a tax lawyer or you want to be one or a CPA, join us for Chris DiNicolo and Ed Morrow's IRA planning opportunity webinar coming up. And then our friend Jerry Hash and one of his star pupils, Joy Spence, are also going to be presenting on business succession planning for Bloomberg B&A, and I get to moderate that. Marty Shankman is coming to St. Petersburg. He and I are going to speak on asset protection and chronic illness planning at the All Children's Conference Center. Please join us August 21st. It's a benefit for the American Cancer Society. There's no charge. Please come to Naples August 25th on a Friday to join my professional acceleration workshop. This is about the seventh time I've given it, so you'll be somewhere in the 200 to 250 people who have taken it, and everyone has enjoyed it. So bring your problems, bring your goals, achieve something new and exciting, and help out Ava Maria Law School. And then spend the weekend at the Ritz-Carlton. Jerry Hesch is going to be speaking for the Jewish Federation in Sarasota, October 17. It's a luncheon for donors. And then Jerry and I are going to speak that late afternoon, early evening for uh, professionals. Now I'm going to turn it over to Lester for the really exciting stuff. Lester, what's going on in the new health law? Hi, Alan. Thanks. Um, so first, to just briefly touch on the um, what are more properly called the amendments to the Affordable Care Act. It's, I don't think there's anything on the table that repeals or replaces it. Um, I was going to do a side-by-side -side comparison of the of the Affordable Care Act, the House bill, and the Senate bill. Uh, but the Senate has, as you sure you know, delayed action on its bill, and we really don't know what's going to be in the bill that's going to eventually, presumably, uh, be voted on by the Senate, assuming they can get there. So I decided not to do that because whatever I put up would be irrelevant um, based on what the bill says today because it's certainly going to change. Um, the House bill is probably a non-starter. At some point, the Senate and the House will have to um, convene um, to work out their differences if they can, which might be easier said than done, to come up with a final package for a vote. Um, if you've been watching it, it's an interesting process because the, Republic, the, the, the Senate, which, which you think would be easy since it's majority Republican, isn't so easy because both conservatives and moderates oppose the Senate version for different reasons. Uh, clearly, the most well, well, clearly one of the most problematic issues would be the uh, reduced funding to Medicaid and the numbers of insured that both the House and Senate says House bills would uh, result in you know 20 to 22 million people losing their health insurance, and that is somewhat politically impalatable to certain factions within Congress anyway. So in terms of CMS, just nothing really exciting has gone on there. There have been some um, delays in regulations uh, as a result of the change in administration. There's been some tweaking of proposed um, or regulate, final regulations that have not yet gone into effect to make them, um, I guess I would, I'll, I'll use the politically loaded phrase, somewhat more Republican friendly. Well, uh, hey, Lester, we, I, I don't know what kind of phone you're using, but the voice is breaking up a little bit if you can get closer. Okay. Is this better? I was on speaker. That's that's a hundred times better. Thank you. Okay, probably with the speaker. All right. Um, so as I was saying, that in terms of CMS, um, I'm not aware of anything really exciting happening. There certainly have been some changes to proposed rules or final rules not yet implemented that um, um, are kind of what you would expect from a Republican administration in terms of some. Um, um, loosening of certain what otherwise would be restrictions. We haven't seen a wholesale change yet in terms of anything at CMS. Um, don't know necessarily that we expect to in the near future. I mean, the Medicare program is what it is. 
and there will certainly be changes at the margins. There was a lot of expectation among physicians, I think, that uh, particularly physicians of a Republican bent, that the new administration would stop the audit process by the Medicare contractors, stop enforcement, or make it far more um, minimal. We have seen no evidence of that occurring or any evidence that it will occur. In fact, you know, things that have been said by Jeff Sessions in terms of civil or criminal enforcement have suggested there won't be much of a change. Um, and, and we don't see much of a change coming from the Medicare contractors on the auditing front. You know, they recover too much money and there's too much money to lose if they get lax. And I, I think that the um, current administration um, has an understanding of that as well. Um, but so, at least so far, nothing. The end of the year, the new fee schedule bills come out, uh, proposed regs rather, come out in probably August, September, October, which always have a number of changes, but they're not out yet. So let's talk about Florida. So the Florida legislative session, as far as health law goes this year, was not certainly not the most active in recent years. Uh, but there are a number of bills that are particularly of interest to um, physicians. The handout that uh, the legislative summary that um, I think you were provided access to is now slightly out of date because it reflects that some of some bills had not yet been uh, signed by the governor. But as of this morning, all of the bills in the summary have been signed by the governor. So these are all bills that either became law as of the stroke of his pen uh, or will become law um, as of their stated effective dates. So just one change to that summary. So um, we had a, a webinar a few days ago on, on medical marijuana, but I don't know that everyone on this webinar may necessarily have attended that one. So I'll touch on a couple of, of highlights. Um, that, that law was um, or does um, implement to some degree the uh, Amendment 2 that was passed by the voters um, in November, um, allowing now use of medical marijuana for many more conditions than was in previous Florida law. And so there was quite a struggle to pass something to implement it. Uh, that was one of the, the main purpose for the special session in the legislature, and, and they did accomplish that, that goal. Um, a couple of highlights, um, as I mentioned, the um, Amendment 2 um, greatly um, expands the number of conditions for which medical marijuana can be um, prescribed by a physician. Technically, it's not prescribed, certify the patients, but I'll use the word prescribed. The interesting couple of them are um, for any terminal condition, which is a pretty broad category, Another one is, although the, the Amendment 2 lists a number of conditions specifically, which are in the outline, it also includes other debilitating medical conditions of the same kind or, or class as or comparable to those that are enumerated. And so that's a pretty broad um, category potentially, and physicians who are certifying physicians will need to be cautious that they have some basis for deciding that a condition falls into that category because if they certify a patient for medical marijuana that's inappropriate, um, that can actually result in criminal penalties. Um, given the somewhat vagueness of that term, I think it would be hard to prosecute a physician criminally for that, but there could be um, administrative penalties. The other broad category are, is chronic malignant pain, which is defined as pain that is caused by or originates from either a qualifying medical a qualifying medical condition and persists beyond the usual course of the qualifying medical condition. Um, so pain that is caused by any of the listed conditions or similar debilitating conditions, um, can you, one can use uh, medical marijuana to treat it. Um, in prior law, there was a 90-day waiting period. Um, that no longer exists. Um, this law also establishes a new role called a caregiver. A caregiver is someone who can assist essentially a minor who's receiving medical marijuana. So that could be obviously a parent, but just being a parent isn't enough um, in order to be a caregiver, meaning that you can handle the medical marijuana and its delivery devices. Um, the law lists a number of requirements that have to be met 
and those are listed in the summary, so I won't um, I won't cover them again uh, currently. Um, and then in terms of qualified physicians, as they're called, the, the qualified physician has to complete a two-hour um, uh, continuing education program and then do that at relicensure. Um, I think it's important to note that a qualified physician who's able to certify medical marijuana for a patient uh, cannot have any sort of direct or indirect economic interest in um, a medical marijuana center or something called a, a marijuana testing laboratory, which tests the um, potency, et cetera, of, the, of medical marijuana. And the law also establishes a number of standards for qualified physicians. For those of you, so for those of you who are physicians or work for physicians who might be interested in uh, participating in this program, um, I, I urge you to look at the summary, but probably more specifically to look at the statute. Uh, the Department of Health has also issued on Jan, uh, June 16th, it issued a proposed regulation implementing Amendment 2 that is, is again, just a proposed reg, but will become final. Um, and again, so if, if it's something that you want to do or considering doing, um, I suggest to review these requirements carefully. Um, you know, this might be a, you know, this is going to be essentially a cash business, so it could be a way to generate um, some extra revenue for a practice, but it does come with a number of requirements and, and some potential risks that need, you know, to be considered. You know, it's not just sort of uh, free money, if you will. Um, the other point to keep in mind is that the use of marijuana is still a federal crime because it's a it's a Schedule I um, narcotic, and so the sale of it, the use of it, perhaps even the prescription of it is still a federal crime. The Obama administration obviously did not push that issue. Um, Attorney General Sessions is particularly anti-marijuana. He thinks that it is uh, more of a problem than others think it is. Uh, I don't know that they're going to make any effort to actually stop the all these the many states now that permit the use of at least some form of medical marijuana. Unclear what they're going to do in terms of recreational use. Um, there is a bill that, pending in Congress that probably won't go anywhere that prohibit prevents the Department of Justice from interfering with states' laws regarding the medical use of marijuana, but. Uh, I'm not sure that bill has any uh, traction, so it's um, something to, to keep in mind. Um, I'm going to skip merrily along now to um, Bill 229 called Healthcare Practitioner Licensure. Um, this bill does two things. Uh, one, and, and most significantly for most, you know, for, for more practitioners probably than the other, number two, is it updates the operation of the impaired practitioner program in Florida, which uh, desperately needed some updating. Um, one of the things that it does is that it allows um, licensed practitioners to report practitioners that are having or suspected of having impairment to a consultant that is contracted by the Department of Health rather than to the Department of Health. And that consultant is not permitted to report report to the Department of Health um, absent the uh, practitioner um, becoming a serious danger to the public health, um, an immediate and serious danger, or they fail to complete or is terminated from um, the, the program that they agreed to participate in. In those circumstances, the consultant is required to notify the Department of Health and an investigation and, and disciplinary action will follow. Um, similarly, um, the consultant is prohibited from notifying a self-reported -report, physician who seeks treatment out themselves, um, again, absent the um, um, physician's immediate or serious danger to the public health or failure to follow through with, with the program. Um, another little change that actually is important for those of us who represent practitioners, it authorizes the release of information to both legal counsel as well as to um, other individuals that are designated in the statute. Um, and it also requires that if the consultant does disclose anything to the Department of Health, that a copy has to be given to the um, practitioner. Um, the other thing the bill does, which may have somewhat limited application, 
But prior to um, this bill in the I can't remember exactly when, and maybe 2000, 2002, the um, legislature uh, passed a bill that prohibited a physician from obtaining a license um, or having a license renewed who had certain disqualifying felony offenses. Um, and the, um, the bill has gone through a couple of amendments, and it became a little bit of a mess. But what the law now does is that it exempts from the denial of initial renewal licensure to individuals who were arrested or charged uh, before July 1, 2009, when the um, um, a new licensure, that may have been when the original licensure disqualified uh, disqualification was in, enacted. So certain practitioners who had very minor offenses, um, for example, I was actually involved in, in the drafting of, of this bill and uh, represented a practitioner who had a somewhat minor drug sale charge back whenever it was, uh, well before 2009, and his um, renewal was coming up and he was not going to be able to renew the license. Um, and so um, that was catching a number of practitioners um, who had um, probably you know, minor offenses um, at some point prior to 2009. Um, and we're going to get caught and not be able to renew their license. So, um, and the bill was changed to, so the law was changed to exempt um, those disqualifying events prior to that date. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about just briefly is um, House Bill 543. Um, it does a number of things related to nursing, really it's primarily related to nursing. Um, and the Board of Nursing, but there are a couple things in it that do relate to physicians who have supervisory relationships or protocols with nurse practitioners. Um, number one, um, it requires that the protocol be maintained with the nurse practitioner practices rather than having to file it with the Board of Nursing. Uh, and importantly, it requires a nurse practitioner to have a supervisory protocol with at least one physician when practicing within a group practice. So theoretically, prior to this statute, um, a nurse practitioner could have a supervising physician who, let's say, was a solo practitioner somewhere, uh, but she also worked for a, a, um, a group practice part-time, whatever. Um, so theoretically, she could have still been supervised by that solo practitioner um, out in the community, even when working for this other group of physicians. And so now this bill requires that a physician in that group also be designated as a supervisory physician. Um, a nurse practitioner can have more than one supervisory physician for different settings. So theoretically, they could work part-time at one of the CVS, whatever they're called, minute clinics, and have a supervisory physician there. Um, and then they could work for group practice and have a different supervisory physician, would have to have a different supervisory physician um, within that group practice. Um, bill 557, which I think is the next bill, uh, it does a number of things with regard to controlled substance prescribing, but the one that might uh, impact physicians the most, it now requires um, dispensers, which would be typically not physicians, since physicians can't dispense controlled substances, even with a dispensing practitioner permit, but should be aware of it that the dispensing has to be now reported by the close of the next business day rather than within seven days after it's um, dispensed. So this will help physicians who are controlled substance prescribers because they you know, clearly have uh, much more updated um, information than they would have had previously when they're checking the, um, the database, which of course everyone, every practitioner who prescribes should be doing. Um, in order to determine whether patients are getting drugs elsewhere. Let's see, skipping a few more. A lot of these bills really had no impact directly or indirectly on, on, on the typical position anyway. Um, bill 10, 1041, entitled Laboratory Screening. Um, I was just going to point out one, one change is that when a um, individual is tested for HIV uh, in a health care practice, um, they have to be, in a, they are tested positive 
um, it requires a report to the county health department. Um, if but that this bill removes that re a reporting requirement, if the tests are, um, um, oh, I'm sorry, it actually removes the reporting requirement if the tests are conducted in a healthcare setting. Um, and I think that's a mis misprint in this summary. I think it means in a um, non-healthcare setting, uh, which are um, settings that um, whose sole purpose is to identify HIV infections and doesn't provide um, medical treatment. So that could be things like a community-based organization, um, mobile vans, outreach settings, et cetera. And there's a lot of those around, and people tend to prefer to go to them than the physician's office. Um, just for privacy reasons sometimes or not wanting it billed to their insurance company. But now this law also um, eliminates the reporting requirements um, for those settings, um, <clears throat> which should encourage more testing and is one of the purposes behind the bill. Um, our, the next bill I was going to talk about is 1253, which amends the existing statute on rights of patients. And many people probably don't know that exists, but there is one. Um, what this does is now it allows the patient to bring any person of his or choosing to a patient accessible area of a healthcare facility or any provider's office where the patient's getting inpatient or outpatient treatment or consulting with a healthcare provider with some limitations um, that are stated in the summary and, of course, in the bill. So now a, an individual who comes to see a doctor and wants to bring back their friend um, their domestic partner, whoever, their next door neighbor, um, they can do so and can't be, that can't be prevented by the uh, medical practice or the hospital. Uh, it was pretty common for hospitals to limit who could accompany patients to spouses or parents or children or certain other limitations. There were some federal, um, for Medicare patients, there are federal rules that prohibit um, hospitals from limiting uh, in certain ways, but now state law really opens it up and requires facilities and providers to allow patients to have someone pretty much of their choosing with them. And Alan, I know we're done a bit, uh, maybe done a bit early, but those are the bills really I wanted to, to cover. So I don't know if you have any questions or someone yeah, in the well, audience does. Yeah, Lester, from what you just talked about, what are the top two or three things that we really need to make sure that physicians recognize that could be dangers to them based upon these? Well, there, 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 yeah, there, there's nothing um, huge in these laws. I mean, the, certainly physicians who intend to uh, certify patients for the use of medical marijuana need to uh, become thoroughly familiar with uh, the, the law that was passed and the regulations that are proposed in some point, some regulation will be passed in the not too distant future. And failure to follow those very carefully are you know, likely going to result in problems for the physician. So a physician who's not participating in that program um, isn't going to have, obviously, an issue. But those who do really need to pay careful attention and ensure that both they and their um, offices are familiar with what's required in terms of documentation, et cetera. Um, there's really not, um, sorry about that, my phone's ringing everywhere. Um, there's really not a lot in here that puts new burdens on the average physician. Um, I mean, the laws that affect physicians most directly, like healthcare practitioner or licensure, actually. Um, helps, you know, doesn't put new burdens on physicians, but relieves them of some burdens if they fall into the category of, of either um, having a prior conviction or having a um, substance or other sort of or a mental health issue. Um, there's not a lot in here that presents serious problems for the typical physician. Um, and this was, like I said, this was not the most active legislative session. Um, with regard to healthcare issues outside, particular you know, of medical marijuana, which really took up a lot of the time of the committees um, on healthcare issues, it was very hard for that that bill I worked on, the healthcare practitioner licensure, worked on with several other people. You know, it took a, it took some effort to get it in front of committees and get it in front of the 
uh, into a bill and in front of the full legislature. Um, and so things just, you know, the legislature was preoccupied with other matters, but particularly the medical marijuana um, implementation law. Okay, and then as far as what you've read about the Republican uh, Obamacare replacement bill, what what strikes you as being interesting or conversational about what they've done in that bill? Well, I, you know, in terms of the, the two bills, which are fairly different, but I think, you know, I mean, like I, I said at the outset, the one of the issues that's of key concern to a number of folks, both Republican and, and Democrat, and certainly a huge concern to governors of both parties are the significantly reduced funds for Medicaid. Um, the the House bill kind of just can, you know creates a block grant program where the feds would give the states the money and say, here, you, you deal with it. Um, both bills significantly reduce the amount of funds available for Medicaid. And I think, you know, the, the Congress fails to recognize, I think, how many individuals now are really covered by Medicaid in Florida. It's a very, you know, it's, it's a significant percentage of the population. And when it comes to deliveries and newborns and um, the elderly in terms of paying for nursing homes, because both of these bills would significantly impact the ability of elderly who don't have assets to be able to pay for nursing home care, which now they use Medicaid. Um, the funding for that is, is you know, very good chance that will dry up significantly. Um, so that's that part of both laws is a real problem um, in, in, to some degree in both parties. Um, and I think as a, you know, it's hard to tell what's a problem for our president, but it appears to be a problem for him in the White House who, because he did promise that Medicaid recipients would not lose their health care. Um, whether that was a hollow promise or not, I don't know, but we'll, that remains to be seen. Um, the other thing that strikes me is I think that there appears to be you know, a move now to make this process maybe more bipartisan. Up to now, it's been strictly partisan. The, the committee that developed the Senate bill, for example, included no Democrats. They really didn't talk to Democrats. Um, I was at a, uh, spoke at a conference not too long ago um, in Chicago where we heard from uh, both a Republican senator and a Democratic senator who are on committees that are involved with, with theoretically involved with these bills. They're not actually going through the normal committee process um, for political reasons. Um, and their version of life was entirely different. The Republican senator was, oh, we've tried to communicate with them um, and they don't want to help us. And the Democratic version was they haven't reached out one iota and no, they haven't communicated with us. So who knows what's true, but there seems to be some, a little bit of momentum to bringing the Demo getting Democrats involved to speak, if no, for no other reason politically to take some of the heat off of the Republican party. Um, the president in some comments yesterday didn't seem to be inclined to include the Democrats. So it's unclear where that's, where that's going to go. Um, I think the other thing that's just of note, like I again said at the outset, this isn't a repeal and a replace. You know, this is an amendment of the existing um, laws. Uh, one of the things, you know, the party, the House and Senate have differed on is their approach with regard to mandates of coverage. The, the House bill did have something, the Senate bill originally didn't, and then they added some sort of um, a waiting period um, that if you don't buy coverage during the open enrollment, and then you try to get coverage, you can't. You have to wait a period of time and pay out of pocket. They're trying to put some incentives back in to buy insurance because otherwise it completely uh, will, will um, devastate the risk pools for the insurance companies who are writing these policies. Um, and so that'll be interesting to see how the two chambers sort of reconcile one another's um, approaches. Okay, and then is anything changing on the CMS side, aside from the Accountable Care Act? I mean, there's no, just the usual tinkering with things. There's no um, significant, you know, mind shift, if you will, in, in policy 
um, an implementation of policy and implementation of the Medicare program. Things, you know, again, you know, CMS handles Medicare and Medicaid. Obviously, things seem like they're going to change with Medicaid once the uh, a bill is passed, if it ever is, and there's no certainty that it will be. On the Medicare side, again, it's tinkering. Um, I'm doing a few things that the Obama administration did on, on some um, quality measures and quality payments. And I, I think over time, things will be made somewhat, there, there's a goal to make things easier because the, the reimbursement mechanisms now for physicians, as physicians who are on the call will know, are becoming extremely complicated um, with what's called MIPS and other quality measures. Um, it, it's you just don't submit a claim and get a, get a check back, um, and you're subject to losing money. You're subject to getting um, bonuses if you do the right thing, and these are very complicated laws uh, and regulatory schemes. And I think it's pretty clear that CMS intends to try to unravel some of that, make it simpler, uh, but not do away with it because I, I think you know, they, they probably realize the uh, policy behind it that would sound moving from a fee-for-service uh, mechanism to a quality uh, mechanism so that um, there's an emphasis on keeping people healthy rather than just paying when they get sick. So I, I don't think there's going to be any, at least that I can see, hugely fundamental shifts at this point in, in CMS and how they're administering the Medicare program, but there certainly will be some tweaking. Right. Okay. Well, Lester, thank you very much. We. Uh, Welcome any questions, comments, or suggestions on the webinar program. You can email me at agassman, A-G-A-S-S-M-A-N, at gassmanpa.com. If you have any questions, I will definitely forward them to Lester. And have a fantastic day. May the rest of your time be billable. Thanks again, Lester. Okay, take care.